The Australian Financial Review. In January last year, when Treasurer Jim Chalmers was asked about a PwC partner leaking confidential information, he didn't hold back. Absolutely furious. Absolutely ropeable. There is no consultation without trust. You know, this is a shocking breach of trust, an appalling breach of trust. At the time, Chalmers had no idea about the extent of the scandal. PwC was insisting that only former partner Peter Collins was involved. By May, it emerged that Collins shared the information about proposed new tax laws with dozens of partners over many years. And they used it to win business. This was a scheme designed at the highest levels of PwC Australia and their global network that was actioned to take money from the Australian people, having taken confidential information from the Australian government. Since then, there have been resignations, reviews, promises of change and new regulations. But more than 18 months after the tax leaks first came to light, PwC is still grappling with the fallout. The thing to understand is before all of this, PwC was a preeminent consulting firm in the country. When you walked in the room and you were a PwC partner, people turned around and looked. You had gravitas and status. And now you were walking into rooms and people were asking you, are you involved in something like this? It was just embarrassing. Earlier this month, in front of a parliamentary committee, former Chief Executive Tom Seymour finally accepted responsibility. Can I just start by just acknowledging that in my various leadership roles at PwC, things went wrong. PwC did not meet the expectations it accepts of itself or others would expect of it. And I accept accountability for that. Welcome to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray. Today, professional services editor Edmund Tadros tells us about his recently published series on the scandal, for which he spoke to more than 40 insiders. He talks about the rise of a sales-driven culture at PwC, why the firm bungled its response after the tax leaks became public, and why it has failed to move on. It's Thursday, August 15. Ed, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It's a pleasure. I love coming on this podcast. You've been reporting on this for a year and a half now. Our colleague Neil Chenoweth first broke the story at the start of last year, and then you and he followed it, and it reverberated throughout the firm, the industry, around the halls of parliament, and throughout the country, really. It was what everyone was talking about in their living rooms. You've spent the last few months working on a five-part series on the scandal for which you spoke to more than 40 insiders. What did you find out? Well, look, what I got asked to do by Michael Stutchbury, our former editor-in-chief, about June last year, he wanted to know what was going on inside PwC when all of this had happened and what the tax office thought of it all. So um, around April, I started working on it. Um, So I sort of dodged it for a few months because I knew it would be a big task. I went back and spoke to dozens of people, and there were two key takeaways from all of those interviews. One was really to understand how the firm had ended up in a position where it was sharing confidential information. It had changed from quite a conservative accounting firm into a sales-driven culture, and so that sales-driven culture sort of overtook what you would think of as um, ethics and rules around how you behave. And the second one was what happened was bad, but actually what made it much, much worse was the firm's inadvertent or advertent cover-up, depending on how you look at it. They just didn't understand what had happened until it became public. So they locked themselves into a position of, it's one guy, former partner, years ago, not a big deal. And then you read the emails that we reported about um, in May 2023, And actually, it's lots of people over several years in a concerted campaign to make use of the information. And by that stage, the firm had locked itself into a position for four or five months, and it was a bit too late for them to sort of backtrack on that. So, Ed, let's start with this sales-driven culture. Where did it come from? Look, there are really two key players in all of this. 
It's the two former CEOs, Luke Sayers and Tom Seymour. And you go back roughly two decades when they're both partners at PwC or what, what becomes PwC. And Luke is a rising star at the firm. He's been in America. He's been made partner in America. He's back in Australia. One of his clients is Telstra. So he's in charge of all the important clients as a consultant. And unusually, he gets made um, head of tax and legal. And it's quite a technical area. And it's quite unusual to put someone in there that doesn't have a background in tax. And his sort of go-to guy in tax is a guy called Tom Seymour, um, a few years younger than Luke. And they're very different characters. Luke's very blokey. He's like he's like a footy coach, very enthusiastic, um, very positive. He's now president of the Carlton Football Club. What are you thinking, Prez? He uses football metaphors all the time. They keep fighting. they got some grit. They I never say never. Seymour's a bit quieter, very technical tax expert, very precise, very detailed oriented. Sign up to a confidentiality agreement with government around a consulting arrangement. We record that centrally so we know it's been done and then we can ensure. But somehow these two guys really get along and they work really well together and they do really, really well when Luke um, is in charge of tax. Over the years, they really turbocharged growth in the tax division. It had sort of been going okay. They do things like they um, encourage cross-selling. That's getting the tax advisors to talk to other clients, existing clients of the firm. Another is having their technical experts meet with existing clients to help increase the size of a job. And of course, uh, underneath all of this, they're very, very good at finding loopholes. So nothing illegal. Uh, so once Sayers gets in to lead the tax division, it goes really, really well. So, so far that's sounding pretty good. You know, they're promoting sales, they, they're out there, they're getting more clients. When does that sales-driven culture become a real problem for PwC? It takes a while. So the thing about taxes is it's highly regulated. And the reason it's regulated is that if you give advice that is problematic today, you don't know for years that it's a problem. The client doesn't know for years it's a problem. And what looks okay today may not look as good when it goes before the courts. So in some respects, you're better off being conservative. PwC, they're seen by the ATO fairly or not, as being quite aggressive in their advice. So they're not advising illegal things, but they're advising things that are quite technical, you know, within the law, but um, they're looking for loopholes and things like that. That's a bit upsetting to the ATO who say, look, that's not really within the intent of the law. But the tax advisors go, well, that's our job. Our job is to look at the law as it is and to provide the most aggressive advice we can to clients. So by the time um, Luke Sayers becomes CEO of the firm in 2012, the tax office has got a pretty firm view that PwC's advisors, alone out of other advisors, are among the most aggressive. When it really becomes a problem for the firm is around 2013, the Australian government via the tax office becomes part of a global push to rein in multinational profit shifting. And they start talking about a bunch of global laws to rein this in. It's a particular problem in Australia because we get a much higher percentage of our tax revenue from corporate tax as opposed to other countries. And the coalition government at the time says, we're going to look into this. And that's where Peter Collins comes in, the former PwC tax partner. He's part of a confidential group of experts that are advising Treasury on the design of these new laws. What happens is, and we don't find this out until years later, and the tax office doesn't find it out either, is that Collins then leaks confidential information about those new laws to PwC partners. Those partners, and it's local and overseas partners, use it as part of a marketing campaign to market their services to help multinationals deal with the laws that Collins is helping design. The firm also comes up with a scheme that sidesteps this law that Collins was helping design. And it's those two things together that enrage the tax office. But at first, the tax office actually doesn't know about the confidentiality breach. What they're first aware of and very, very upset about is the structures that are sidestepping this brand new tax law. It's almost like they're too prepared for the tax law. Yeah, they're, they're, they're too prepared to both market it to their clients. So literally on the evening um, budget 2015, when the then treasurer, Joe Hockey, announces it, that night they send out pitches to 23 clients saying, we can help you with this. Mm. So they're pretty prepared. So Ed, that enrages the ATO. How do they respond? What do they do? 
So what happens in 2016 when one aspect of these new laws come in, the ATO sends out all these taxpayer alerts saying we're aware of people sidestepping the laws or using um, structures we're not happy with. And it all comes to a head for PwC in August of that year when PwC meets with the ATO about their client Uber. Basically, the PwC partners say, hey, there's a structure in place here and it sidesteps this new law. So essentially, the new law doesn't apply to our client Uber. The ATO loses their mind over this, basically. And they go back to the office and they make it clear to Uber and PwC, this is unacceptable. What happens pretty quickly is Uber fires PwC and it eventually restructures into a way that's acceptable and brings it under this new law. So the ATO basically cracks it and starts using its information gathering powers to ask PwC and its clients for documents about their tax affairs. In response, PwC and the client start claiming legal privilege or LPP. That's where they can say, oh, actually, these are these are done for the purpose of legal advice. We don't have to give them to you. This makes the ATO even angrier and they start doing information requests on top of it. So over the space of about four years, they do 46 or more than 46 information requests. This is another thing that upsets the ATO. So this begins this three to four year long document war between the ATO PwC and the clients are dragged in as well. And they're finding out they don't have LPP and they're going berserk separately. So it's a real mess. The then CEO at the time, Luke Sayers, is sort of briefed on it in 2019. And they do start to do some changes. So the governance board gets involved, but it's still serious as far as the ATO is concerned. PwC seemed to have the view that, oh, we've changed and we've reformed. And there were changes and partners pushed out. But what happens in 2020 is the firm's partners, who largely don't know about any of this, vote Tom Seymour in as their new CEO. This is an unhappy sort of move for the ATO because the guy who's been in charge of the division that has had this sort of long battle with them is now in charge of the whole firm. And the firm is considered systemically important because of the auditing work it does, the tax work it does. And now you've got a guy who was in charge of it, in charge of the whole firm. And what the ATO does is, is part of those, um, the documents it was requesting, it's cottoned on to a few years earlier that Collins may have leaked some information and it hasn't known what to do with this information. It's tried to get the AFP to investigate and a few other things. Shortly after Seymour becomes leader, it kicks the whole thing over to the Tax Practitioner Board, which is a little own agency that polices um, tax agents. The TPB then investigates it, takes about two years, and makes findings against Collins and PwC. The TPB suspends him for several years. And then at the beginning of January 2023, Neil, acting on tip-off, writes the initial story, which kicks the whole thing off. But then, Ed, PwC's response was, there's nothing to see here. It's just one partner. And that's when Senators Deborah O'Neill and Barbara Pocock really pushed things along. Talk about their role and what people were thinking inside the firm as the story got bigger and bigger. Okay, so late 22, the Tax Practitioner Board finishes its investigation. It tells the related parties, look, this is what we've found. It suspends um, Collins for two years, which is is actually on the lower end. Um, And PwC has to do some um, new processes around confidentiality agreements. People are asking about it internally, and um, one of the problems for the firm is they've done an investigation, but somehow this investigation, it's involved external legal counsel, has been very, very specific and said, look, it focuses on the TPB's findings. One person was involved sharing information. It was years ago. That person's no longer at the firm. And as far as the firm's leaders are concerned, and Seymour's in charge, this is bad. This, it's not a big deal in general. Neil writes his story in January. You know, as we've mentioned, the treasurer gets upset. It looks bad, but really, it only the, the story's only going for about a week and a half because there's not really much place for it to go. What then happens is um, Deborah O'Neill, late at night in a Senate hearing, asks the head of the TPB, a guy called Michael O'Neill, no relation, how many people he reckons are involved in the tax leaks matter, and then he says to her, amazingly, from the evidence we have, maybe twenty or thirty, Senator. Everyone's shocked. 20 or 30 people. 20 or 30 people evident on the documents we have available to us. And then what happens a few weeks later is that Tom Seymour is at the AFR summit. He's on stage. He gets asked by our senior columnist, Jenny Hewitt, what's going on with this 20 or 30 people? And he famously says that... The issue for us is there's a perception issue. 
which is a bit weird because it seems like an actual problem. And he goes back to that same argument, what the TPB found was against one person. So it's really minimising it. Senator Pocock, who's been behind the scenes pushing Labor to do an inquiry into consultants, uses these two pieces of information to go, look, an inquiry would really be a good idea. And Labor agrees, which is a bit surprising because normally you wouldn't get a government calling an inquiry into something that could drag itself into it voluntarily. But everyone is so upset. And one of the key things about this whole saga is PwC has united all ends of politics. So you, you'll often get Liberal, Labor and Greens people all asking questions. Almost in concert. In concert, which is quite unusual. And I've never quite seen anything like it before. And from there, it just snowballed. The other thing that happened behind the scenes is that um, Senator O'Neill has asked for the emails that TPB used to come to its conclusions. And normally these questions, I notice, they're pretty hit and miss affair. Most of them sort of bring up non-answers or nothing that exciting. But it turns out, in this case, the case would be released in May last year, which is when we do our largest story. What then happens, and this is surprising for everyone involved, is that people within the firm can't stop talking to us. And it turns out the reason is they're upset about what's happened. They're upset about the confidentiality leaks and what was done with the material. But they're much, much more upset at their leaders and they're talking to us to tell us all about it. And then they find out within days of our story that actually one of the key leaders is involved. He was on the emails. Ed, we've been talking about the sales-driven culture that developed within PwC and how that more aggressive approach played a part in the tax leak scandal and why the firm is still struggling to move on. What's been the fallout for PwC so far? What's changed? So for PwC, the firm is a third smaller. It was forced to sell off its government consulting arm last year. That's about 100 partners, about 1,000 staff for a dollar. So that, that was a catastrophic loss for the firm and it also affected many of the people who went across because they've gone from being paid as part of a partnership to being employees now. So in the long term, they may do all right, but it's a short-term hit. The careers of hundreds of partners and potentially thousands of staff have been derailed. Being part of PwC used to open doors. Now it's it can become a slightly embarrassing admission and you need to explain. And God forbid if anyone says, were you involved in this? Like, that's an awkward conversation to have. They're still winning work, but a lot of their, it's hard for them to hold on to people. So a lot of the really sort of um, really good talent are moving to other firms and you've seen them go to a lot of the startup firms, um, a few going to other big four. The other thing that's happened is that their global business, so the sort of franchise owner, if you will, PwC International, took over the firm once uh, once the leaks matter sort of hit its stride in about June or July last year. They've appointed their own CEO to the firm. And so essentially Australia is under the control of the global business. And the view of a lot of current and former Australian partners is fundamentally PwC International was interested in the well-being of the entire network. And what happens to their profits doesn't affect them because the the profits are all pulled by country or by region. There's also still a lot of investigations and scrutiny going on. There's an ongoing investigation from the Australian Federal Police into the matter. The TPB has nine different investigations and the professional body chartered accountants ANZ is also looking into the activities of some of its members. And there's also a separate ongoing joint inquiry chaired by Senator O'Neill about the structure of the big four consulting firms. For the ATO, there's been some reputational damage. Uh, Second Commissioner Jeremy Hershorn has basically admitted to Parliament that if he had his time again, he would have referred Collins to the, the Collins matter to the TPB earlier. And I think another thing they might take away from this is that they're the regulator and they really need to regulate What they kind of tried to do for years was to lightly enforce the rules while working with the firms, asking it to behave. It didn't work. Like, you could see it didn't work. These firms, and especially the partners likely to do this, really, I'm afraid to say, they only understand strength and consequence. You can't ask them to do the right thing. You have to tell them, if you do not do the right thing, we will take action, or you just have to take the action. 
As far as regulation goes, the government's tightened laws around tax advisors and beefed up powers for the TPB and the ATO. It's put into law all these new penalties around tax promoter breaches. So they've done a lot of things specifically to stop this happening again. And as for the government, the tax leaks matter gave them an excuse to put in place a policy they'd already announced, which was to beef up the public service and to cut down the use of consultants. So they've made good use of this to really fulfil that policy quite aggressively. And what about the key players? How have they been affected? What are they doing now? Okay, um, we still haven't heard from Peter Collins, the man at the heart of this. He's living in Melbourne, hasn't spoken publicly. Seymour, The former CEO spoke publicly for the first time at a parliamentary inquiry a fortnight ago. I did not describe this issue as a perception issue. I've never thought it was a perception issue. I acknowledge what I said was clumsy. What I said was I said I actually tried to quote the exact wording in the finding the TPB had given us as a firm, which had the word perception in it. He acknowledged he was under investigation by the Chartered Accountants. He's now director of a mattress company, Sealy, but isn't working otherwise, as far as we know. And then there's Sayers. He launched his own firm, Sayers Group, in 2020. He described himself as being belted in the media for 15 months over the tax leaks matter. You seem so frustrated. Because I have been, um, I, I have been belted well, you're for 15 chance. months yeah, yeah, in the that. media. Get that. So he's been bruised by this, but he's also the president of Carlton, which is like being royalty in Melbourne, so he's moving on with life. There's a bunch of partners who are pushed out and named by the firm. Some are suing, some have sued successfully. One has found a new, quite high-profile job. Several have opened their own practices, but many of the others aren't working. And then, in a broader sense, a lot of partners are just opting to leave to go to other firms. A lot are retiring earlier, and there's an ongoing deep unhappiness about what's gone on. Jeremy Hirshen was up for ATO commissioner, but didn't get it. They brought an outsider in. And look, I think he has regrets, but he's moving on as well. Michael O'Neill remains the head of the TPB. And there's another sort of new player in this. Would you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, Kevin Burrows, Senator. I'm the CEO of PwC Australia. He was parachuted in by PwC International to take over the firm, and he's brought in quite wide sweeping changes to governance, independent directors, an independent chairman on the governance board, and in other ways of the way the firm operates and appoints senior leaders. But he's under pressure also about his salary disclosure and whether he has a conflict of interest because he's being paid by both PwC Australia and PwC International. Did it not cross your mind, Mr Burrows, that you should have disclosed to the Senate and this committee that you were in receipt of an additional $1.2 million, which seems to put you in a position where you are the person carrying a very high level of potential conflict of interest, serving two masters, both PwC Australia and PwC International. Senator, when I answered your question previously, I believed that you were interested in my role as CEO of PwC Australia. I do have another role. Uh, for PwC Network, for which I receive remuneration. And what happened two weeks ago was he had to admit that he'd taken a year to tell his partners and his chief ethics officer that he's being paid um, by international as well. In fact, in just recent weeks, I understand that Mr Burrows was in receipt of additional payments, not just $2.8 million to do the job here as an Australian representative for the Australian entity, but $1.2 million from PwC International. Chair, I wasn't aware of it, as you say. I was surprised to learn of it at the time. And so that's caused him unnecessary problems. That's like an own goal, really. So, Ed, more than 18 months on from when the first story broke, and after all these discussions you've had with insiders for your series, what do you think? Will PwC be able to shake this scandal, or does it have many more months, if not years, to play out? No one is more surprised than me that I'm writing about this still. A lot of that is the firm sort of saying all the right things, but not quite doing all the right things, especially in the eyes of parliament. So it's interesting to still keep writing about it because this really will lead to quite widespread change and has already led to widespread change and I think improvements in the way the, the industry operates. But it's also terrible 
from the point of view of current and former partners involved and people working at the firm or who have worked at the firm, they'd all like to move beyond this. And they and the firm just can't seem to do that. And when you think about it, what's still unbelievable is there's a lot of details about this we just still don't know. We don't know who specifically beyond Collins and one or two other people did the leaking. We don't specifically know what information was leaked. Uh, We don't know what they used the material for. We don't know what's in the material that they used. We don't know how the firm came up with structures that sidestepped this tax, how they came up with it, whose great idea it was, and also why no one said actually, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we shouldn't be using this information. Maybe we shouldn't be marketing in this way. Maybe we shouldn't be advising clients in this way. So there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of finger pointing. Um, I keep thinking of the Spider-Man movie where you have lots of Spider-Men pointing at each other. That's what this is like. That's what it was like a fortnight ago. Everyone was very sorry. Everyone regrets what had happened. No one individually did anything wrong. And as soon as they knew about it, they looked to resolve it. But if that's true, then why are we here? And the firm under its new leadership still has some ongoing problems. There's a report into what the international partners did as part of all of this. PwC International got a law firm to look into it and they've got a finding and they've given, you know, they've released publicly two or three lines of it, but the parliament has been quite obsessed with getting a hold of it. You've got to ask how they can really reform if this was an international exercise and we only know the barest detail of what happened in Australia, and we definitely don't know what happened overseas. So that's a real problem for the firm. There's a view within some parts of the firm, look, we've suffered, we've been embarrassed, we've changed, can we all move on? It's really hard to sort of accept that while this international report remains secret, while a lot of what's happened remains secret. And what the firm has relied on for years and years, and I think this is across the sector, is you have to trust them. We've changed now, this won't happen again. It's hard to have faith in that. So I really hate to say this because I really feel for all of the partners affected by this, all of the staff affected by this, but this comes down to culture and can the firm change its culture. But really all of the incentive structures fundamentally are sales driven and profit driven. And separately, almost unbelievably, you've still got current and former partners who say this wasn't a big deal. This is a beat up by all of our enemies out there. So until all of this changes, I don't see how the firm can move beyond the scandal. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray with Edmund Tadros reporting today. The Fin is produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. It was edited by Martin Peralta. Fiona Buffini is the executive producer. Our theme is by Alex Gow. If you like the podcast and want to hear more, consider sharing it or writing a review as it helps us reach more people and follow wherever you get your podcasts. For more stories about markets, business and power, subscribe to the Financial Review at afr.com slash subscribe. See you next week.